All right, it is a little bit after four o'clock and I am going to launch this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. And this afternoon, we'll be focusing on a recent book by Georgetown University philosophy professor Nancy Sherman entitled Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience, published by Oxford University Press. And joining us this afternoon as commentators uh, are a Barbara Mujica of Georgetown and Massimo Piliucci of the City College of New York. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, uh, which I chair with Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center, who's not with us this afternoon. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly, uh, meeting weekly uh, in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center and since pandemic restrictions, well, here in the virtual realm. Behind the scenes are a couple of people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And I'd like to thank one of our institutional supporters, the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous individual donors. And as always, we invite you to join their ranks. On a logistics front, please note today's sections, session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. When we get to the Q&A section, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function that will allow you to actually pose the question in your own voice or use the Q&A function on Zoom. Those watching on Facebook Live can email questions to Rachel Wheatley at rweatley, R-W-H-E-A-T-L-E-Y at historians.org. All right, and now uh, I would like to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Nancy Sherman is university professor and professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. She served as the inaugural distinguished chair in ethics at the US Naval Academy. She received her PhD from Harvard in ancient philosophy, an MLIT from the University of Edinburgh, a BA from Bryn Mawr, and she has research training in psychoanalysis from the Washington Center for Psychoanalysis. She is the author of Stoic Wisdom, the book we'll be talking about today, uh, After War, published in 2015, The Untold War, 2010, uh, and Stoic Warriors. She was a Guggenheim Fellow and a recipient of many other awards for her work, including a Wilson Center Fellowship and appointment as a public policy scholar. Nancy, the Zoom room is all yours. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, Massimo. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, uh, Christian, who isn't here. And a shout out to Rob Litvak, who started the ball rolling. And to the Wilson Center, uh, as, uh, as you heard, I've been at the Wilson Center a number of times and books came to fruition there. So, and to Flip Strom, uh, who may or may not be with us this afternoon. Um, so Stoic Wisdom got its animus, or I should say I got mine, uh, thinking about um, all those many depictions of ancient and modern Stoicism as sort of tough grit resilience uh, that's go it alone self-reliance. And, uh, at the Naval Academy where I was, it had a rather inelegant term. It was suck it up and truck on, whether you had a little less or a big S, or it got even a less elegant phrase, which was embrace the suck. So I, I got it that uh, being in multiple deployments um, and uh, the deprivations of even boot camp uh, and war, fog of war, where best laid plans get thwarted very easily, to think of Stoicism in that way was very, very helpful. But I have a background in ancient philosophy and, as uh, Eric said, research training in psychoanalysis, and I've always worked on emotions and moral psychology. And then at some point, I got uh, tapped, essentially, to work with the military leadership on issues of suicide prevention, <sighs> Uh, destigmatizing mental health in the military and the like. And so the idea of embrace the suck really ran up against everything I cared about professionally, um, as well as uh, uh, what I thought was a healthy way of thinking about stoicism. So I felt impelled to write Stoic Wisdom um, and think of it as something other than just stiff upper lip, which the you historians can tell me, but I don't think it's just British. I think it's an Amer actually may have been an American phrase. So let me um, begin with a few um, theme 
uh, notes. So one, about the emotions on a Stoic view. I came away convinced in years of teaching Stoic texts and also uh, in um, writing this book. And my, my Stoic texts, uh, the founder Zeno of Kidium, um, not the Zeno of um, the hare and the tortoise, Chrysippus Clay and a predecessor of his, Cleantes, and then the Romans more familiar to us, um, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, um, that they weren't really keen on draining us of all emotions. And I thought it obscured the texts to think of that. So I don't think, you know, they weren't really counseling as philosophical therapy and they were, they did view themselves as therapists. It's a Greek word. Um, of, of, of snuffed out emotions, you might say, or austere, expressionless, buttoned up kind of uh, demeanor, or really renting us of the social fabric. Instead, I thought the real Stoic, the real Stoics had emotional skin in the game, as I put it. Um, and I think of them as the most nuanced early ancient uh, emotion theorists. They have kind of proto-arousals, proto-emotions, uh, someone like Joseph Ledoux at NYU, a neurobiologist calls them uh, fast road, uh, low, low track emotions, I think is his term, um, fast track. Um, and other emotions that can run away from us, nonetheless have cognitive bases, whether it's fear or, uh, or anger. And so, then there's a third layer of emotions, which we're supposed to try to get at, a little bit like Aristotle's emotions of the mean, but a, a sort of more exalted version, which are the good emotions they call uh, rational joy, rational wariness, uh, and a kind of rational desire. So these are ways in which you can kind of have emotions without all the panicky aversion or the sticky acquisitiveness. And even your, your demeanor could show it. So one of my favorite texts is Seneca's uh, on benefactions, on favors. And he says, when you're giving a gift, if you give it with a furrowed brow or downcast eyes, um, it's like giving someone bread with stones in it. And then he says, words may fail you. You may not be able to say the right thing. Uh, but if you feel the indebtedness, it should show on your face. So this is a sort of a sense of being uh, emotionally expressive, whatever the internal state is. What about stoic social connection? Uh, are we supposed to be attached, connected? Is there social fabric? Um, I think the modern view, which is often about life hacks, um, Massimo and, uh, and I have talked about the tech bros out there. Um, it isn't just life hacks or self-help. Um, you know, the one Epictetus talks about athletics, athletic training for the soul or the psyche, but the discipline was always moral. And if it's moral to do with virtue, it has to do with our relations to others, our collective endeavors in a, in a better world, locally and globally. So for me, the graphic image is Marcus Aurelius. He's on the shores of the Danube in a campaign, Germanic campaign, and he notes that uh, you know, if you've ever seen body parts lying apart one from another, that's what we make ourselves of ourselves and we cut ourselves off from each other. So it, it, he picks up the idea of a predecessor, Diogenes, a cynic, a colorful guy who essentially says, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a city without borders. I'm from everywhere and nowhere. I'm a citizen of the universe of the cosmos, the original term cosmopolitan. So they the Stoics actually give you a visualization practice. Imagine concentric circles, you're in the center, bring the circles that are most uh, extended outward to your center, and with a kind of zeal and commitment, try to imagine that they are your kith and kin. Adam Smith, um, a Scottish Enlightenment figure, called it uh, trading places in fancy, and imagine an exercise in empathy, essentially. So that's a way of thinking of what would become very rational for Kant, shared humanity is coursing through the veins of empathy almost. Now, what about indifference to the world? That's a, a, a stoic theme in the popular world. Um, and for many stoic practitioners, you can change what's inside, but you can't ever change what's outside. That's a bold and bald way of putting it. But the idea is, it, as Epictetus puts it, it's not events that disturb you, but it's your opinions or your judgments, your appraisals of them, the estimates. 
But in the book, Stoic Wisdom, I argue that the very tools that can put a buffer between the outer world and the inner world are ones that can change the outer world for the better. So we see through personal biases we don't even know we have. And the Stoics essentially offer techniques for slowing down impulsive thinking that can cloud your judgment. And Seneca puts it this way, that you can assert, excuse me, insert um, attention and will and try to monitor your more impulsive impressions and then the quick bodily responses that would follow. Um, now, of course, you're wired by nature to, uh, to you know, respond to threat or hot objects and run up and put your, move your hand away. But that said, some of the quick responses we have are not particularly rational or uh, um, congenial to others. And so he says we, we should be aware of ways in which we distort uh, our judgments through our assents is the word, word. So we don't retreat, but we rather, I think, engage in the wor world. And the Stoics have a very uh, weird word for all this, all the things that Aristotle would call external goods, health, luck, uh, even your healthy relationships, et cetera. They call them indifference, and they say some of them are to be promoted or preferred, some are to be uh, demoted or dispreferred. It sounds almost like an economist's language, the language of preference behavior. But so these are really ways of, um, I think of them as uh, attitude shifts, behavioral shifts, a little bit like um, rational cognitive rational behavior theory. And so not surprisingly, people like Aaron Beck and um, Albert Ellis, who were the founders of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, say they were influenced by the Stoics. So we do traffic in the world as Stoics. We're in it. We're trying to figure out ways of mitigating the vulnerability, figuring out ways of living with calm and a dedication to virtue, which may change not which may require not just acquiescing to the world, but changing it through what we assent to. So what about a sticky subject for me? And that is the sort of misogyny that sometimes goes with stoicism, especially uh, in pretty toxic sites online. And um, I did go down some of these rabbit holes. And in some cases I was following Donna Zuckerberg's um, not all white men or whatever the name of that book is close to that um, in 2018. Um, she noted that Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus are often on the lists of some of the Reddit sites or red, red pill subreddit. So manly character as the story goes is very stoic and it, it doesn't require emotions and other things that we just talked about. So here, I think you can, do no better than go to Epictetus's teacher and not a, not a household name though. My husband loves to say his name in our household because it's a nice name, Musonius Rufus. So Musonius Rufus um, essentially said that um, virtue had no gender and that women as well as men could come to his lectures and that they could be there for uh, because they had a natural talent and natural ability just as men did for, uh, for virtue. So he said they've received from the gods the same rational faculty as men. And they also share with men a desire for ethical excellence and a natural orientation toward it. So at least uh, one of the founders in a text we don't often read was uh, keen to open the doors of the stoa, which is the portico, the colonnade, uh, where in the agora, uh, agora where they met to women. Now, what about some meditative practices? These are a little more familiar out there that could calm your soul. Well, one is this idea of pre-rehearsing bad. So this is, you, you, if you anticipate and you go from the trivial to the more uh, consequential. You, break a, you might break a jug in your course of uh, drying up the dishes in the kitchen. Think about it in advance so it doesn't, uh, you don't have a, a match with your husband about, or your wife or your spouse, you know, you shouldn't have put it there. Da, da, da. Rehearse in advance, anticipate some of the, the downside of, of life. 
you're going to the gym. There could be pickpockets and jostlers out there, people uh, that, you, that won't give you a calm afternoon. Think about it in advance about how annoying people can be so you're not going to be caught off your guard. Essentially, don't be blindsided. Uh, and then move up to the hardest one, mortality. And so um, in the book, I, I sort of was reminding myself that my mother never wanted to talk about death. It was just like off, off the table. So I figured I'd have to make a joke of it. And what would be the joke? The joke would be, um, did, did I sign you up for the immortality plan at the nursing home? Because if, if I did, it was going to be really expensive. This got a rise out of my mom. And it was a way that we could begin to anticipate what for her was a scary thing, pre-rehearse the bad of mortality. Um, another one that I like is mental reservation. It sounds a bit like hedging your bets. I'll go for a picnic. I'll go for a boat ride, says Seneca, unless it rains. It sounds a little bit like Virginia Woolf waiting for to go out <laughs> with her family to whatever that island is off the coast of, of England. And uh, it, so it's not so much that you cushion all the blows, but rather it's a little bit like you're trying to always catch up with information because the goal is to be fallible. It's a, not, not, not a, a Descartes had a lesson here, but we are in, we, the goal is to be infallible. And so you're trying to know in advance what will happen, but you have to be able to be agile and shift your, uh, uh, your plans very quickly. So I often think about it in terms of financial markets. Uh, the past is not necessarily an indication of past performance. It's not an indication of future performance. That's a little bit like what uh, Seneca and others are saying. Learn to be agile and adaptive. Finally, the one that maybe is most familiar is meditate at the end of the day, journaling. And Seneca says when it's quiet and his wife has gone to sleep and she knows his habits, he's going to think about all the things that didn't necessarily go well during the day. He's, it's very much uh, about talking to yourself, a bit of psychotherapy a bit. And he's pretty harsh on himself. You know, you screamed at a servant, someone, uh, your students were a bit too cocky. Uh, what's another one? Uh, they didn't put you at the dais in the banquet hall. They put you in the back of the room and you deserve better. Kind of goes on like this. A bit of uh, Steve Martin once said to... Um, um, Carl Reiner, my bother you. It's late at night. I know we have a shoot tomorrow morning, but I needed to go over things. So no, I'm just going over my litany of failures. It's a little bit like that, but uh, so soul searching, and it can be kind of you know beat up on yourself. So not the quiet of of Eastern meditation necessarily. It's a it's a self reflection about your moral state. So chimney sweeping, I guess Anna O called it. Um, Breuer's uh, famous patient and Freud's. A patient. So to sum up, what I try to do in Stoic wisdom is give you a healthy modern Stoicism that's rooted in ancient texts. Um, I think they give us, the Stoics really give us important lessons, practical lessons, but also a complicated theory. I'm teaching a graduate seminar right now on this stuff, and this theory is really complicated. A complicated theory about ways of facing our vulnerability without denying it, but trying to find a little bit more calm in the face of it without stripping us of emotions, without stripping us of emotional expression, and without making us narrowly tribal but connected in more global ways. And so I think Seneca at the end of On Anger puts it best. He, his rallying call is, let us cultivate humanity. And so goes the history of moral philosophy and political philosophy onward in that, in that rallying call. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Our first commentator this afternoon is Barbara Mujica, who is Professor Emerita of Spanish Literature at Georgetown, specializing in early modern Spanish theater, women's writing, and mysticism. The mother of Marine, she was faculty advisor to the Georgetown University Student Veterans Association and co-chair of the Veterans Support Team. Two of her books, Imagining Iraq, Stories and Collateral Damage, Women Write About War, to which Nancy Sherman was a contributor, were inspired by her work with veterans. She is also a novelist. Uh, her novel, Frida, was an international bestseller that appeared in 18 languages and was a Book of the Month Club alternate. And her latest novel, Miss 
Del Rio is to be published next year by HarperCollins. If I were to go through the rest of her resume uh, and publications, uh, we would be here uh, all afternoon. So let that suffice. Uh, and Barbara, uh, the Zoom room is all yours. Well, one of the things that I do is review books, and I did review Nancy's book. Uh, and soon after I did, uh, I received a call from my goddaughter, uh, whose 12 year old son was giving her a lot of problems. He had, uh, he was very wild. Um, he had a lot of temper tantrums and, uh, and she was very anxious to buy the book. She was very excited about it uh, because she said she was sure that it would change both their lives. And it did. Um, in, in her discussion of stoicism um, and the emotions, uh, Dr. Sherman argues that anger, uh, for example, does not simply overcome us. Uh, we, we assent to it and, and choose what we think is an appropriate behavior, behavioral response. But once we give in to it, we can no longer control it. The notion that we have to assent to anger in order for it to unleash its destructive behavior sparked numerous conversations uh, between my goddaughter and her son, with the result that he is better able to control his tantrums. I'm not saying he's an angel, but uh, he, he's more he's more aware of of what's going on with him when he when he becomes very angry. And this was only one of the many responses I received, uh, in which readers commented on the practical applications of this book. As Dr. Sherman makes clear, sto stoicism is not an arcane, useless subject. I think she made this very clear in her comments. It's an accessible philosophy with pithy wisdom that can help us deal with the stress of everyday existence. It's not an elitist philosophy. Um, it seeks to guide people in all walks of life uh, in their search for calm, in a very chaotic world. The goal is inner strength, woven through and through with goodness rooted in reason, she explains. Its methods are both philosophical and psychological. Although Stoicism has been, call, has been called the new Zen, unlike Buddhism, it does not teach, as she explained, disengagement from society and the eradication of the self. Dr. Sherman is not urging us to find an isolated mountaintop where we can contemplate the great mysteries of the universe in silence and seclusion, uh, but rather she explains, stoicism teaches self-mastery within the context of daily life. And I think that this is um, one of the most important messages um, of the book. And I think that's something that people often overlook. It, provide, it provides tools for building resilience in the face of ever-changing, ever-confusing, ever more confusing circumstances. Now, uh, in the face of the pandemic, uh, we need these tools more than ever so that we can make reasonable decisions and not panic. Dr. Sherman explains that anticipating adversity is key to the stoic approach to easing anxiety, anxiety, as she explained. Uh, but that does not mean that preparedness depends on the individual alone. For to be ready for a crisis as monumental as the pandemic, we need the participation of, of, of many people, of government uh, agencies, of institutions, of uh, dedicated individuals. And I think that we have to be aware of who those people are and, and be willing uh, to, 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 to interact with them and, and to uh, accept that we're not totally in control our, ourselves. Um, while recognizing the limits of our personal control, we still must accept agency. We have to realize that we do have responsibility and we have to discipline ourselves to prepare for difficult circumstances. And this means marshalling our inner resources and preparing 
to act rationally and virtuously in a crisis. The self-discipline and concentration required to perform lucidly and honorably in a crisis requires that one holds one's emotions in check. But Dr. Sherman argues that the Stoics uh, need, the Stoics need not be impassive. For Stoics, she explains, emotions are voluntary mental actions. Although for some, the notions of self-reliance and rugged individualism are precisely the appeal of Stoicism, um, without each other, we are severed body parts, as she wrote, fragmented and, uh, and disconnected. We can't function well or at all. For true Stoics, social supports, family, friends, um, helplines, as well as inner strength are essential to building resilience. That is the ability to bounce back after a calamity. One area, area Dr. Sherman uh, explores in this book in detail is the effect of Stoicism on the military, a topic which it was a uh, particular interest uh, to me as I was faculty advisor of the Veterans, uh, Student Veterans Association at Georgetown. Um, and she's written extensively uh, on the effects of moral injury on soldiers. That is the emotional damage that they suffer when when they perform when they when circumstances demand that they perform acts in the line of duty that conflict with their own moral beliefs i think all of us who have dealt who have dealt with uh with soldiers uh, have have dealt with this i should mention my own son is a marine um in this book, she revisits the subject, uh, noting that Admiral James Stockdale, who was shot down and imprisoned in Vietnam in 1965, derived enormous strength from the writings of uh, Epictetus, uh, Epictetus, a Roman slave who believed that true freedom resides in self-mastery. However, Dr. Sherman explains the suck it up and truck on phil philosophy which uh, soldiers learn in training can be harmful when carried to an extreme. It's helpful sometimes, on the, uh, often on the battlefield, uh, when, when they know that they just have to do it and they just have to keep going and they, they witness horrible things and uh, they lose friends sometimes. But they, and, and in those cases, the suck it up philosophy helps. But the problem is that. Uh, after they leave, after they exit the military, um, that philosophy doesn't allow them to deal with their emotional problems. Um, and so these, these soldiers who have, who have committed acts uh, that, they, that they conflict with their own moral and ethical um, scheme of things, uh, they, they can't just suck it up. Uh, they're overwhelmed with shame, pain, anger, and sometimes their moral injury is so serious that it makes them suicidal. So, uh, but, but Dr. Sherman uh, insists that this very moral injury may open the way for moral growth and the calm of repair. But for that to happen, soldiers must face the realities of war and the moral ambiguities involved. For Dr. Sherman, extreme forms of stoicism are not practicable for moderns, uh, yet we can glean from the ancient and modern stoics certain principles to enhance and facilitate our lives. For example, although we can strive for psychological mastery, this should never be this should never come at the cost of human vulnerability. Uh, that is, the suck it up philosophy should not inure our us to our own suffering and the suffering of other people. Rather than see ourselves only as self-determining individuals, we must learn to live in community, respecting and supporting each other. Furthermore, we must monitor our emotions and not allow them to drive our perceptions 
or our behavior. And this, this idea of um, uh, in the evening uh, when everything is quiet, going over your day and, and, uh, and facing your moral triumphs and failures uh, reminds me very much of the Jesuit uh, examine of conscious, conscience um, which uh, if you've ever done this, uh, well, Georgetown University is a Jesuit university and I have done the, the retreat and uh, uh, I find that a very useful way of ending the day. So I, I have questions, but they'll come at the end, right? Um, you can post them now if you wish. Okay, um, well, I, I know Massimo, I don't wanna, run into his time, but I'm, I'm just I'm gonna ask this one question to begin with and then I can come back to some of the others. Um, so this is for Nancy. Um, you describe yourself as a neo-Stoic in the book. Uh, can you explain exactly what that means and why you apply that term to yourself? Eric. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, I'll just give the real quick answer. We people that do history of philosophy never know what to call ourselves. <laughs> Am I an Aristotelian, a, a neo-Aristotelian, a Kantian or a neo-Kantian? You, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. So uh, I, I suspect I would put it this way. I love reading texts, uh, but texts uh, are, are obviously from their periods. And we all have to figure out how to grapple with ancient contexts for modern times. So I'm uh, not particularly interested in, in um, banning these texts that can have very problematic uh, flavors at various moments. Um, and so I, you know, I, I read texts and I give lots of interpretations and I try not necessarily to rationally reconstruct them, which is a popular term out there in philosophy, but rather to do my best to read them in ways that seem faithful to the texts, but also that breathe some uh, um, meaning into them that we can sort of hold on and go forward with in an honest way. Long-winded answer, you know. I could call myself a Stoic, but I at least want to take one step in the modern world. <laughs> I, I, I had to laugh when I read it because, uh, and I teach a course that deals with skepticism uh, in early modern Spain, and I asked my students, uh, I always ask them to, to try to practice skepticism, which is withholding judgment. It's not taking a negative view, it's withholding judgment uh, for an entire weekend to see if they could do it. And of course they can't, you can't withhold judgment. Uh, I mean, you have to make a judgment, is the car coming? Is it, you know, is it gonna hit me? Um, so, I, so none of them could do it. And I had to admit that I can't do it either. So. <laughs> we right. do we teach this stuff, but you know. <laughs> So later in the session, please join the conversation and ask further questions if you, if you have them. Um, our next discussant is Massimo Piliucci, who is the KD Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. He has a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Connecticut uh, and one in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. His books include How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live Like a Modern, uh, published by Basic Books in 2017, Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk, a second edition published in 2018, and a co-edited volume, A Handbook for New Stoics, How to Thrive in a World Out of Your Control. Massimo, the Zoom room is yours. Thank you so much. So what I think I uh, would do, or what I would like to do is to touch on a few themes for discussion. So these are kind of themes that I would like Nancy to comment on uh, later on. Maybe not all of them because I have six or seven of them. Uh, you, can, you can pick and choose, uh, but also maybe getting a conversation with, with, with Barbara. So these are some of just my reflections that come about uh, from both reading Nancy's book and sort of more broadly from uh, having been involved in teaching and writing about stoicism and practices, sto practicing stoicism for uh, several years now. So, for instance, the, the first one that comes to mind is, is whether Stoicism has a problem with language. I, I just can't tell you how many times I have to spend uh, 
some of my time in earlier presentation explaining exactly what a preferred indifferent is, because as you know, it sounds like an oxymoron, or as a preferred, there is an indifferent. What do you mean I should be indifferent to uh, you know, my relatives dying or something like that? And of course, that's not what the story could mean. They don't mean that you should be indifferent in the sense of not giving a crap about it. Uh, they just mean that uh, external events don't uh, make you don't affect your character. They don't make you a better or, or, or a worse person. In fact, it's quite the opposite. What makes you a good person is how you handle uh, external uh, external events. But nevertheless, there seems to be uh, a constant issue of uh, with with uh, stoic language in within a modern context. Another one is the the use of virtue. I mean, if you were in ancient Greece. The word would be arete, which means really excellence, and it's not really problematic. Everybody understood what uh, what it, what you would be talking about. But after two thousand years of Christianity, uh, you know, when somebody hears the word virtue, they immediately start, you know, thinking about purity and chastity and stuff like that, which has got nothing to do with what uh, the Stoics were thinking. So, one possible uh, issue to to talk about, or one possible. Uh, thing to reflect about is whether in fact uh, stoicism as popular as it has become recently has a problem with language and what if anything can or should be done about about it now as you heard uh, a second a second point comes uh, to mind because as you heard uh, Nancy does have does share my uh, problem with what is sometimes referred to as broicism so this this notion that Broys, that that stoics uh, stoicism is about you know this macho attitude and it's a manly thing and all that sort of stuff. Uh, she, I don't think she mentioned it in the uh, opening remarks, but there is an, uh, another type of uh, what I've considered distortion of modern stoicism, which I sometimes refer to as Silicon Valley stoicism. So this is the notion that uh, you can use stoicism to become a, a billionaire or to be successful at your at your business. You know, I I read articles. Uh, claiming that uh, Jeff Bezos is a Stoic, for instance, and in my mind, at least, there is nothing further away from a Stoic than uh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos. So there are some distortions, or what, what at least I would think of as distortions of Stoicism that hang around today, and actually, they are very popular. They, they, they arguably account for a certain, uh, a significant percentage of the interest in modern Stoicism. And so one thing, again, to talk about, maybe, perhaps, is uh, to what extent these these uh, are problematic, the broicism or the Silicon Valley stoicism are problematic in terms of a revival and especially acceptance of modern stoicism. Now, of course, uh, Nancy has a lot of experience teaching military ethics. Uh, she has written uh, in multiple occasions about the connection between stoicism and the military, the usefulness of course, for uh, military personnel of stoic techniques and a stoic general approach. However, uh, I think that we it, it's useful to make a distinction here between the techniques and uh, the philosophy, right? So the techniques are certainly useful, just like, as Nancy pointed out, they are connected, uh, they, they inspired the rise of cognitive behavioral, the origin of cognitive behavioral therapy back in the 60s. Uh, CBT is one of the best evidence-based type of uh, psychotherapies out there. So clearly, a lot of stoic techniques do work, especially if updated to sort of on the basis of uh, evidence from modern science. However, one thing, as I said, is technique. Another one is the, is the philosophy. You know, you, you can do, for instance, the evening journaling, which I do agree I, with, with uh, both uh, Nancy and Barbara is is a, a very good, very effective, and very interesting uh, sort of exercise. But you can do that without necessarily buying into Stoic philosophy. You don't have to be a Stoic or think of themselves as a, yourself as a Stoic in order to you know to, to do some journaling, um, and in fact get benefits out of journaling. Uh, one possible analogy might be with Buddhism. Lots of people meditate uh, and use different kinds of meditations that are. Uh, derived from Buddhist practice, but that doesn't mean that they're Buddhist. In order to be a Buddhist, in fact, meditation is neither necessary nor sufficient. Uh, what you need to do is to buy into some of the basic precepts of the philosophy itself, such as the Four no Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path to, to Enlightenment. Now, in the case of Stoicism, 
uh, you know, doing the evening journaling or the, the premeditatio malorum, the thinking about bad stuff happening uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, uh, is also not neither necessary nor sufficient to be a stoic. What is uh, necessary and I would argue sufficient is to buy into some of the basic precepts of the philosophy. Now here, I think that might be an issue when we're talking about stoicism and the military, because after all, some of the basic uh, precepts of, uh, you know, uh, assumptions uh, and, and tenets of Stoic philosophy include cosmopolitanism. So the notion that we are all, all humanity is, a, is made of our brothers and, and, and sisters, and that we should treat everybody accordingly, uh, regardless of where they live or who, who they are, as well as a um, process or a concept that is uh, referred to as okeiosis using the original Greek word, and that broadly speaking means appropriating other people's uh, uh, you know, concerns. And the notion is that a Stoic is supposed to appropriate uh, everybody else's concerns, not literally, not in the sense that you go around every day thinking about all 6 billion people on earth and how they uh, might manage their lives, but, uh, but ideally, meaning that you should uh, uh, practice this these notion of getting in sync with the rest of humanity. Now, that to me seems to be fundamentally at odds with uh, the military attitude, at least as it is often either portrayed or practiced. In, and, and now this is not to say that the, the ancient Stoics were, were pacifist, they were not, uh, nor is it to say that the modern Stoics should be, uh, but I do think that there is a tension there that might be interesting to uh, discuss, to, to, to unpack a little bit. Uh, a couple of other things that I, might be interesting to talk about, for instance, uh, since I've just basically started talking about politics. Well, politically speaking, the ancient Stoics uh, were in favor of, uh, they thought, first of all, that you could live and be virtue, virtuous under any kind of political system. And that's true. You know, it's a, you, can, uh, you can be virtuous in a democracy and you can be virtue even after under a fascist uh, government. Nevertheless, they did write, especially the early Stoics, uh, you know, uh, Zeno and Chrysippus, they did write about what kind of society ideally uh, we would want and what kind of state uh, we would want to uh, develop. And uh, by and large, what they suggested was uh, a, a state that is a mixture of, had a mixture of democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy. No such state existed in ancient Greece, but Republican Rome, for instance, got, got pretty close. I would say, in fact, that described that way, the modern United States comes pretty close. Yeah, we don't have a monarch, but we have a strong presidential uh, figure and we don't have an aristocracy, but we have you know, uh, a Senate, for instance, that is supposed to be made up of people who know what they're doing. And of course, there is a democratic element in terms of elections. So my question here might be, uh, those, are, those were the ideas of the ancient Stoics. What should, if anything, a, a modern Stoic think about politics? Is there such a thing as, uh, a political party or position that is com particularly compatible or incompatible uh, with Stoicism. Um, speaking of okeiosis, the, the process that I mentioned uh, a minute ago of sort of appropriation of other people's concerns, uh, what do we think of modern attempts to expand it even further? Some modern Stoics, for instance, think that not we shouldn't just be concerned with humanity, we should be concern concerned with all sentient beings. So anybody that is any, any animal species that is capable of um, experiencing suffering, experiencing pain. So does that mean that a modern Stoic, for instance, in order to be uh, in sync with the notion of okayosis should be, should adopt it, something like a vegetarianism or something like that. Again, an open question. And finally, the one, the, the last one that I want to bring up is what, if anything, does modern Stoicism have to say about uh, very compelling, very important issues that we are facing, for instance, protection of the environment. There are some modern Stoics, like Chris Gill, for instance, who have written about it, but it would be, be really interesting to me to, to hear what um, uh, Nancy has to say. So that's, uh, that's pretty much my, my suggestions for discussions. Thank you, Massimo. Nancy? Great. Thank you so much, Massimo. You're uh, terrific. I don't think I'll get to all of them, but let me, let me take a stab at some of them. Problem with language. I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, having to um, dig the Stoics yesterday in class out of their tangle uh, regarding the indifference. I think they're laying, you know, and the ancients, they're commentators, Plutarch, uh, Diogenes, uh, uh, Laertius, uh, uh, many, Cicero, 
who is the go-between uh, between the uh, old Stoa and the Roman, the old Greek Stoa and the Roman Stoa. They're all, you know, uh, leveling arguments against the Stoics. Do you really need all these different, you know, terms? What do you, what are you gaining by it? You just made stuff up. You're really, you're really an Aristotelian. Those things you call indifference, they're no different than Nicomachean ethics, external goods. They're the same thing. So how, why call them something different? I think they're calling them something different and they need to call them something different because they're trying to figure out a way to give them value, but not the same value. You know, they're real. It's not just they don't make a difference to your character. They don't make a difference to your happiness, to your flourishing. That's a pretty bold claim. I mean, it's really bold. You, you're going to tell me that I lose everything and I'm I'm at a border and turned back. You know, we're seeing pictures of, of the Haitians being turned back every day. We're assaulted with similar kinds of issues. It'd be hard to say that your your happiness isn't impacted. You know, you may be able to hold on to your character, but even character gets corrupted when you take away a lot of these goods. They're really very strong on this. Um, you know, I think in some cases too strong. I think we have corruptible characters and I think our happiness can get eroded, uh, not just our characters, but our happiness can get eroded. So they need to make a strong claim um, and they do make a strong claim. And then it's for us to try to, you know, weaken the claim a little bit. <laughs> um, Silicon Valley, tech bros and all that. Yeah, um, I can't speak for Jeff Bezos. Um, I, I did do a little bit of digging around on Jack Dorsey, Twitter, Mr. Twitter, and Mr. S uh, Square or Square Up, whatever it's called. Um, I think they're not so different from Seneca in some ways. You know, they love the pull of the material world and the opulence and the court and, you know, ivory tables and you name it as much as they possibly can have. And then they've, you know, and then there's, if you want to call it guilt, but there's a retreat. They need to get away from it. They need to have the opposite pull. Uh, you know, and one, I don't quite get living forever, the life hack, biohacks, where you can, all you want to do is uh, uh, figure out a way to live forever. And not just, you know, maybe it is ego, you know, you want your, your, your great ideas to, and your great inventions in Silicon Valley to be there. So you, you can see the fruit of your investments. Um, but I think it is in part a, a kind of internal struggle. They have alter egos and they, you know, they want acquisitively and also they want to be abstemious, you know, and they can't figure out how to be Socrates or, or Zeno or, Cleantes. They're a little bit more like Seneca in this regard. I think he's a um, he he's a stoic, I think, in part because he feels the pull of the material world and has to figure out a way to mediate it. Um, technique versus philosophy. Great question. Um, yeah, the Stoics are uh, very much um, uh, we, we tend to look at them as for tools. That's the idea of a life hack, right? You can kind of have a workaround to be able to figure out stuff that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, have a smooth answer or, or way to solve it in your other other one in your in your normal toolkit. So you figure something out, and um, that doesn't necessarily make you a, a, a stoic uh, to be able to premeditate the bads or rehearse evils or. or think about fears and threats. The cosmopolitanism, I think, is a really important piece. It's hard to um, play out. You, you, you do say, you, you talk about the kind of tribalism, you might say, of, of the military, if that's where you wanted to go. But, you know, the military is a very complicated group. There's no one stripe. There's no one service. There's everyone is, you know, anyone that I know that, was, that served, that was watching the evacuation from Afghanistan last month, uh, uh, felt it very in very complicated ways because they did appropriate in many ways the work and missions and dreams and hopes of many of the fellow interpreters, journalists, reporters that they women that they were working with. So um, I wouldn't paint them. I would you know the I would think of of um, the philosophy. Uh, is embraced by many who maybe embrace the, the, the tough culture, but they don't know they're necessarily embracing this idea of oikiosis, familiarizing yourself with the most outer reaches of habits and 
uh, and uh, uh, and um, mindset of those in the cosmos. Um, can you be virtuous anywhere? Boy, I don't really know. Um, you know, I do think uh, that virtue is tested and gets corrupted if the circumstances are as hard as they can possibly be. Stockdale was a hard case for me. I interviewed him several times and, you know, he, ever, he always said the silver lining for him was being a POW. His wife said, really? Seven and a half years, I'll take my salvation a different way. Um, you know, so... I think reading someone like Primo Levi, you know, survival in Auschwitz, is this a man? It was very hard for him not to them to not steal, to 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 defraud their friends in some ways. If if that's one piece of bread that is your survival, so I I think the Stoic, you know, the Stoics have Socrates in mind. He could do anything, endure any cold, any hardship. You know, he had his foibles too. So it's a very idealized view of virtue. I don't really buy it. Um, I don't know what to say about uh, expand about sentience anywhere, and in, and as well as the the globe. The, the the idea that we live in accord with nature, which is one the another under under a very problematic language, and who knows what it means um, for the Stoics. Is it human nature? Is it the laws of nature that we'll never really know, but Zeus knows or the divine will knows somehow? I don't really know, but I do think we're in a world in which nature is very large. And the Stoics give us a very compelling picture of our place in it and our almost mission to try to understand it in as um, big souled, large scaled, forward looking, almost omniscient way. I don't know how to achieve that, but I know we're short sighted most of the time. And part of why we're short sighted is because of self interest, you know, lobbies and um, um, vested interests and things that, that, that promote our narrow, our narrow causes. And that is not stoic at all. So the short answer, I haven't read Chris Kill Gill's um, most recent stuff, but I think he's one of the best um, stoic expositors out there. I hope I touched on many things. Not all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to now open this up uh, to the audience uh, for questions and observations. As I mentioned earlier, there are a number of ways you can participate. Our preferred way is to use the raise hand function. We call on you, you unmute yourself, and then you can pose the question directly. If you use the Q&A function on Zoom, I get to read your question. Uh, so if you wanna read it, use the raise hand function. And for those of you on Facebook Live, you can email rweekly at historians.org uh, and we'll get conveyed the questions. James Banner has had his hands up. Jim, if you unmute yourself, please pose your question. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, I would like some guidance as a historian as to how I can use the reflections that the three of you this afternoon have offered. That's not so much a question, it's, it's an expression of my desire. Is that possible for one or all of you to do. Oh, uh, well, may I answer just very briefly? I, uh, but please, I don't have any privileged knowledge here. Um, I suspect as a historian, because I, I, I view myself as a, a historian of philosophy, um, I'm always amazed at how much of the enlightenment has uh, been inspired by Stoicism. Um, when I, I, I've written books on Kant and um, especially Kant's ethics um, and this whole idea of living in accord with laws of nature, the uh, uh, um, formula of the law of nature, as we put it for teaching the groundwork of, uh, of, eth of, of metaphysics of morals um, and ideas of uh, the sort of bad ideas picked up from the Stoics that it's all reason and forget those inclinations. Their motives of interest and motives of inclination are the enemy of motives of duty. I, I think that's a bad read 
of the Stoics, but it's one that definitely came down through history that I would correct. Um, I also think, you know, the, for example, the, uh, I mentioned Adam Smith, the Scottish Enlightenment theorists were very influenced. Montaigne was influenced by the Stoics. And of course, um, uh, Judeo-Christianity, they were on the cusp of the same period. I sometimes look at texts by Philo of Alexandria, um, and you know whether or not he's a Stoic, he definitely was talking about Sarah's nervous laughter as she was told she's going to have a baby. Well, that she didn't really laugh; she just had some kind of emotional arousal that wasn't the real thing. Or and or, or Abraham kind of got close to the grave and almost cried, but he didn't really cry; he almost cried. Those are all Stoic inflections of historical texts, or. Or, or at least um, biblical texts that we know that got their steam, I think, from Sto Stoics. So that, that's something. Also, the uh, um, American uh, founding fathers, Jefferson, read the Stoics, Seneca, especially whether or not Washington read it. It was in the air. You couldn't be anyone and not just read this stuff. It was just popular, the Romans, especially popular stuff to read on your night table. Yeah, I was going to uh, actually uh, comment, particularly on the last point that uh, Nancy brought up, that is, uh, there is a pretty good evidence that pretty much all of the founding fathers, or most of them at least, uh, were either familiar or certainly had copies of Stoic texts, you know, Jefferson, even though he thought of himself as an Epicurean, uh, he had a personal copy of uh, Epictetus's Enchiridion, uh, George Washington read from a play about Cato the Younger, uh, to his troops. Uh, so, so there are influences that sort of put, once you start paying attention, they, they, they pop up all over the place. And of course, the influence on Christianity uh, runs deep. Uh, the very early Christian fathers, uh, beginning with Paul of Tarsus, were aware of the Stoics, they engaged with the Stoics, they uh, took quite a few things from the Stoics, and of course, incorporated them in their own uh, worldview, all the way to the late Middle Ages and uh, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so that means that Stoic, th even though the Stoic school per se kind of ended in the second or third century or, or something along on those, those lines, Stoic thought actually kind of is almost everywhere you start look when, once you start looking uh, in, uh, in the history of Western thought, and therefore it's also in the history of, of uh, not only Western ideas, but, but what actually the Western societies did over the last several hundred years. Just on that very point, um, Augustine, I think, took some of the idea of these uh, arousals that you can have and that Aristotle had talked about before, er erections and um, the like, uh, as a bit the devil's controlling you a bit. It's not just your body that's in charge, but a, a, something that a, a, an evil spirit. And so it, it gets worked out in rather interesting ways. But they, they are so, uh, we are so much of the culture of Stoicism without actually knowing it, because they were just popular reads for, uh, for most who were educated at the time. I would like to mention also that uh, the Spanish Golden Age was very influenced by uh, Seneca and uh, the Stoics sense. in general, and uh, Quevedo especially. Well, he was, he was Spanish. He was from Cordova, yes. right? Barbara, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, but you're the perfect person to ask. Someone asked me if the fact that he was from Cordoba and not from Rome meant that he had a kind of different sense of his status, that he was an... Oh, yeah, so that, that's, what, that's what we think. I um, I, you know, it's, it's... What can I say? It's, it's, it's a little bit like you and, and neo-Stoicism. It's, it's, it's difficult to know these things, right? <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I think that, um, well, the short answer is yes. I mean, Spanish historians and Spanish uh, literary experts who specialize in, in, um, uh, in the period, in Quevedo especially, uh, think that Seneca spoke directly to, to the Spanish um, mentality. Thank you, thank you. So I had, I had another, uh, a couple other questions I wanted to ask. Um, so I'll throw these out and if somebody else wants to ask questions, feel free to um, interrupt me. 
Um, but I, this is one thing that I, I was wondering, you know, if I, as a reviewer, got so much response uh, to your book from readers, I can only imagine the kind of response that you got. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, people who read your book and saw the practical application uh, and, and told you specific cases about how, uh, how it affected them. The other question I have, and this is something that uh, I've been kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of in the back of my mind, it's kind of my worry, one of my worry things, um, is the, the notion that our emotions, our reactions to our emotions involve a choice. But in the case of mental illness, is that true? Great, great question. Let me start there. Um, and I'll just sort of say the Stoics are radical volitionists. You know, they, if anything, they overemphasize the strength of the will uh, through this um, linchpin, which is the ascent, which is a belief and including uh, emotions, which are kinds of beliefs, umfi beliefs, I say. Our, our ascents to impressions. The stuff comes in and you, you say yay or nay. And they're, well, voila, you have a kind of belief. And they think that a lot of, you know, you, you were insulted. You may have a little oof, but you don't have to give in to it. You nip it in the bud. And that's uh, where, you, where you grab control. You don't ascend to it, you suspend ascent. And so the idea, of course, we have, not just uh, physical illness, uh, this, Massimo can speak to this. My students had a ball last yesterday talking about the donkey. Your body is just a little donkey and you're a groom, you're a husband. It's like husbandry and you're a groom. I said, well, if you can't entertain your students with these outlandish claims and you know, the philosophy is rather boring. Um, but the, not only your body, is uh, uh, something that you have full control over they, or you don't have control over, they, but they think that your mind isn't either. And so at least at some point, illness, the illness of the mind isn't, but they still somehow have their, I mean, this is true of many philosophers. They think reason is that which you, it defines you and it's that of which you are in control. Do they think about dementia? No. Do they think about Alzheimer's? No. Do they think about what you and I study through working with the military, TBI, traumatic brain injury? No. Concussive disorders? No. PTSD? No. They're not thinking of all that. And so you, and they don't have neurobiology. They don't have MRIs either. You know, so I, I don't think we can saddle them with all of enlightened psychiatry or psychotherapy they give us some that's all and you draw your line and you you know I think this is you know a, a true of many things I, I would be very very distressed if I started losing my mind but they don't think if you're a sage you'll ever lose your mind because the sage and so you won't feel distressed because the sage really doesn't the sage is a god every 500 years you know, philosophy, Massimo began by saying stoicism has a language problem. Well, philosophy has an idealization problem. It loves idealized models. And then you have a whole theory of philosophy called non-ideal. How do you apply ideals to non-ideal circumstances, whether it's Rawls and well-ordered society being applied to this crappy world we live in or other kinds of models. So I think that's the long-winded answer to your, your question. They're not thinking about less than exalted cases in the idealized moment. I'd like to add a couple of things okay. uh, to what Nancy just said. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, overall, you know, broadly speaking, the ancient Stoics certainly don't talk about mental illness or anything like that. Although there is an interesting letter mm -hmm. by Seneca where he says, I think that's the on, on sleeping the cable, when to sleep the cable, where he says, if my mind starts going, this is the, the, the moment where I need to go because there's not going to be anybody else left there, essentially. So at least Seneca was aware that, that mm -hmm. you know, there is a limit to, uh, to how much control you have over your mind. 
But there's also a distinction to be made between, of course, the ancient Stoics and the modern Stoics. I mean, Stoicism is not a religion. It's not like just because some Epictetus says something, then it, it, it stands no matter what. Uh, we have 2,000 years later, we have modern science, we have cognitive behavioral therapy, we have neuroscience, and we are perfectly free to uh, uh, pick and choose certain parts of Stoicism that work and others that don't, and modify the ones that don't, that don't work. Uh, so that said, uh, there is a lot of exam. There are a lot of examples where stoicism is, in fact, very useful to people that suffer from uh, mental mental issues, including depression, bipolar disorders, and things like that. Because, of course, the control that we have over our rational self, over what uh, Epictetus calls the prohiresis, our faculty of judgment, is actually a continuum. It's not a yes or no. It's not a you either have it or you don't. Uh, yes, you don't at all in extreme cases, you know, when, when, you're, when, when your mind is really gone. But in, in fact, it's uh, it probably just like any other human trait follows a kind of a normal distribution. Uh, there are people that really have a good amount of control over their uh, faculty of will, and then there is a, you know, a tapering off. And even the people, however, that don't have complete control or have a very partial control seem to, there is pretty good evidence that seem to benefit from the practice of uh, Stoic philosophy, if nothing else, because they realize that, in fact, even parts of their own mental life are not in, under their control, uh, and that they're and that that is normal. That is that is something they need to accept. Uh, that, that is not something that uh, is uh, a negative judgment on on who they are as a person. It's just a fact of of nature, uh, and therefore, beginning with accepting that fact is, in fact, a Stoic principle that is useful even to people who suffer. Uh, with some degrees of mental illness. Um, just on that point, I think it's a really important point. Um, and I was thinking as you were speaking, um, Massimo, that um, the I mentioned this exalted ideal, but the Stoics are terrific in telling us a lot about development. They really are developmental philosophers. And their notion that uh, has always moved me is the notion of progress, that we're, we're progressors. That's really where the action is. I think that we're uh, all, you know, the, the push and pull that you feel when you read Seneca, I'm not there yet, but I made a few mistakes, but I'm going forward. Or, you know, this letter that I'm writing to you is the letter of a, you know, he says, I'm I, in one of his letters, I'm, I'm, I'm the sick person as well as the doctor, the therapist. And so um, I'm treating myself when I treat you, Achilles. It, it's the, they're really uh, talking about the, waxing and waning of our, you know, of our abilities at times. And so I think the, uh, they, like all ancient philosophy, they really emphasize moral development and, and education, moral education, uh, not only the most exalted uh, pinnacle of uh, perfection. Yeah. We have a question in the Q&A from Richard Suber, who asks, Nancy, will you talk about how a Stoic is not described by the modern connotation of the adjective stoic? I'll try and others can help me. <laughs> um, I don't quite know what the modern uh, adjective with a little s means, but I think it's come to mean uh, sort of what you hear, sort of um, Woodhouse Jeeves. I think there's one of, the, one of those books about being stoic, stiff upper lip, you, um, you, you bear up um, without, buckling and you don't show much emotion and you don't really um, practice grieving. You know, we watched the British monarchy, I guess it was last summer and Prince Philip, some of us watched with interest Prince Philip's um, funeral. And there was more discussion about how, which member of the Royal family was or wasn't stoic, um, you know, was, uh, was Charles stoic enough? Uh, was his sister Anne more stoic? That kind of. So the, the British have often meant to be characterized, not uh, being able to pull your socks up, another British phrase, um, be buttoned up. And for me, that often means expressionless, mo emotionless, whatever goes on in the inside, you don't show it on the outside. Now, Cicero very famously in the Tusculan Disputations, a wonderful work about how he's grieving hard for the loss of his uh, daughter, Tulia in childbirth, that um, he might be, and he hasn't showed up at the forum and you know, he's worried that Caesar might get him. 
I may be able to control the outside, that, that, that one of those beliefs, the belief about how I should behave, but I can't really control the inside that she didn't matter to me, that my daughter wasn't beloved and wasn't really special in my heart. And if I could control it, I wouldn't want to, it would be wrong, he essentially says. So he's putting distance between himself and the Stoics. And I, so I think a lot of um, Stoicism with a little less is that uh, demeanor, maybe Roman decorum, Roman demeanor, British demeanor, um, you know, not being all gooey on the outside, but I'm not sure. The Stoics are such uh, brilliant emotion theorists. They just were the best we have in the ancient world with different layers. And they know all the different qualities. They even describe the different qualities of emotions. Some of when some anger is stenotic, it feels like constrict, like stenosis. It feels like a constricted thorax. They say, um, you know, and 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 others, um, it, it feels like you can't get out of the room. You're choking. It's very, it's very um, um, uh, d phenomenal. It's not. It's got tone. And so I think they're not just, some people say the emotions for the Stoics, the best you can get, this is Tad Brennan, I think one of our colleagues at Cornell, the best you can get is that their motives, their, their motives for action. But I think the Stoics actually had them as having colors and tones. And so you don't get that Stoicism with a little less, but you, they definitely were after, this is back to Barbara's point, they're after more control and maybe Massimo's point, we probably have more control than you think we have. And they're after exercises by which we can regain our control. And if that's what stoic little with a little less passivity is about, not pass, not pass, not passiveness, but pacificness is about, then maybe um, uh, we should think of them, uh, uh, the little s and the big S is going together, but not getting not deracinate or getting rid of all emotions by any means thank you yeah i, would, I mean i may say something about that as well it's, it's like uh to me it's interesting to observe that pretty much almost all, all all of the major hellenistic schools their names still translate today they're still used in regular parlance today and all of them suffer from the same problem of these big little uh, we just heard about big stoicism, little stoicism, but think about big Epicureanism and little Epicureanism. Today, an Epicurean is somebody who, somebody who is into drugs, rock, you know, rock and roll and, and all that sort of stuff. That's not what the ancient Epicureans were about at all. For, for the ancient Epicureans, pleasure, the highest pleasure was a, a life without pain, especially mental pain, certainly not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The ancient cynics were certainly not people who went around always you know, you know, disgruntled and saying no to everything. So the, there is this... Uh, this interesting phenomenon where we have taken uh, almost all of the ancient, the major, the major schools names and then come up with some distortions, but they are distortions. They're not entirely made up. Uh, like there is, it is true that the Epicureans were concerned with pleasure, not, not in the way in which modern Epicureans are, but they were certainly concerned with pleasure. Uh, it is true that the ancient Stoics were concerned with endurance. Uh, and you can see how you go by distortion from endurance to the stiff upper lip. It is true that they were concerned with modulating emotions uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily come natural to human beings. And you can see where one, one might go from a modulation of emotion to a suppression of emotions, which is not what they were talking about. I would say with platonic, there's one, you know, a platonic friendship. I'm right. Yeah. Sure. Aristotle didn't quite get into that lexicon. I'm not quite sure <laughs> what it is to be Aristotelian. We, 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 we do have distorted views of what it is to have platonic friendships. Um, yeah. They were pretty erotic, I would say, if you read the symposium. That's right. <laughs> so let me jump in, if I can, um, with a question that I pose as a 20th century U.S. historian who Great. is not, to put it mildly, well-versed uh, in the historical cast of characters from the ancient world that you write so eloquently about. So I approach this as someone with little knowledge, uh, but with historians' questions. And I'm taking as my point of departure a book that came out in 1979 by the cultural historian Christopher Lash, The Culture of Narcissism. 
And amongst the many things that it tried to do uh, and spoke quite eloquently to was the question of why at that point in the 20th century, um, various psychological phenomena were manifesting themselves. Uh, and he tried to account for this. So in reading this book and in hearing the three of you speak, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that the influence of the Stoics is real and profound, whether it's various Enlightenment philosophers, the founding fathers, uh, Adam Smith, James Stockwell, um, uh, and the list goes on. But it seems that the revival of Stoicism um, as, as, I don't know if it's a philosophy or a way of thinking, a way of trying to live one's life, uh, is a somewhat recent phenomenon. Um, and it has taken root uh, and has become quite popular um, in recent years. And so the historian's question is, why? Why now? What is it about this set of principles or ways of thinking and living that, that is so attractive to a significant number of people at this particular moment in the 21st century? I'm going to um, take a stab. I'm sure others have ideas. And the stab is that uh, we love self-help books, but they've been around for a while. Carnegie Dale, um, you'll know better, maybe 1920, 1930, I can't remember, but a bit, you know, business, how, how to be your best self, that kind of thing. And they're easy to come by. Uh, you've, you can pick them up in a, when we traveled in an airport, um, <laughs> along with diet books and other books. And I also think there's a little bit of an ugly side to it. Um, and that is that not everyone wants to celebrate Eastern philosophy. And so, the, uh, and, you know, uh, and the idea of meditation, that style. And so something that's Western and the, the, Greece and Rome have always been appropriated for better or worse. <laughs> um, the, and so Greco-Roman, it has, bona fides, especially in the Western canon. And that it is also has the word meditation and that it has, it's a very practical philosophy. It's street philosophy. Some of it is street philosophy. That's, it's, some of it's terribly complex and complicated, but some of it had its, um, you know, it, it's flourishing um, in conversation in the marketplace. Um, and so some, so I do think that's part of it. It, the narcissism was a good pick. You know, it's a, it, it, it is the idea of my self journey, my enhancement, and how do I, what kinds of things can be uh, calming in that regard. But I don't, you know, I don't think it's alone in that, in, 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 in that stable of, of things. I, you know, I think also some people who have a lot of money and huge megaphones are influenced by it. And, are, and have PR firms. Tim Ferriss is one such person, an angel investor, in the, uh, one of the Silicon Brothers, you might say. Um, similarly, Ryan Holiday has a very large uh, following and has a lot of, um, can put a lot of money into it um, and, and daily feeds into a very captive audience. So that's some of it. Some of it I do think is entrepreneurial the entrepreneurial side of how you um, discuss self uh, enhancement and self help. That's a bit cynical and the cynic, not necessarily the stoic. Uh, That's right. In the, in the, in the little C <laughs> sense of the word. Um, I would agree with, with your points, but I think there are, there is also, so th those are certainly factors at play. Uh, there are also some other additional factors, not necessarily all of them negative. For instance, let, let me pick on, on what you just said about, you know, not everybody resonates or wants to resonate with, uh, uh, with Eastern philosophy. Well, when I was going through a, series, a number of years ago through a sort of essentially a midlife crisis that eventually brought me to uh, discover and then, and then practice tourism, I did try out a few things. I, I started reading about different, different things, including Buddhism. And um, my experience certainly was that Buddhism didn't speak to me. And I'm sure that part of it is because I, I was You're born Roman. and raised. You're exactly, I'm, I'm literally Roman, right? <laughs> so it's, it's certainly the language were not familiar, the concepts were not familiar. And so I'm not sure that that was necessarily a, a bad thing or a, or a 
or a, or a good thing. It was, it, it was just a thing. Some, for some people, certain, you know, if you grew up in a certain tradition, certain terms, certain concepts just resonate more than others. There's also, yes, you mentioned Ryan Holiday, absolutely. Yeah, that, that certainly is, is a factor. And, uh, but there's also been a concerted effort by a number of uh, scholars and psychotherapists, actually, CBT practitioners who are interested in stoicism that literally sat down a number of years ago in a room and said, hey, you know, this, more people should know about this thing. And this is how the Stoicon, the annual Stoicon event and Stoic Week events uh, came about. So to some extent, there is actually, it was actually a purposeful engineering, engineering of a return to, of, of Stoicism. Of course, you can engineer all you want. If there is nothing there then that, that interests people, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to fizzle out. So, so it's a combination of things that were done and are being done on purpose. I think, uh, you know, the, the modern Stoicism organization, for instance, now is pretty well uh, put together and they, they organize a lot of events that does uh, help. Uh, but, but, if, but if people didn't feel like this was useful, it wouldn't go anywhere. Okay, I have a slightly different take on this. Uh, so I write a lot about um, St. Teresa of Avila uh, and not necessarily in a religious well, obviously in a religious sense, but also in a philosophical sense, because she had her own approach to, uh, to spirituality. And uh, St. Teresa has also become incredibly popular. There are whole industries that have developed around St. Teresa. Uh, Carolyn Meese has a, has a collection of tapes and, and books and uh, videos and all kinds of things uh, related to St. Teresa and book after book, Publisher Weekly, when, when my novel on St. Teresa came out, Publishers Weekly um, wrote, because mine was not the only book that came out that year, uh, that Teresa of Avila was a saint for our times. And my, my feeling is that um, a lot of people are very disillusioned with our own institutions. Uh, I think institutionalized uh, institutional religion is not speaking to a lot of people, uh, and they find answers uh, that they're that they need and that they're looking for in classical philosophies, in uh, in a religious approach that that focuses more on um, on interiority than on uh, ritual and rules and what you eat and what you, how you dress and, and, and that kind of thing. And I think that these philosophies and these approaches to spirituality really respond to a need that modern man has. I think in the past, people, people had their, they had the church, they had their religion, they had uh, they had they had an accepted um, philosophy, uh, 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 an approach uh, to to politics, democracy. Democracy was the the only way. It was the good way. And now people are questioning things, and they're looking for other avenues of uh, of inquiry. And I think that. Stoicism and different kinds of spirituality meet those needs. Thank you. We only have a few more minutes, but I wanted to ask a question about virtue, then and now. If you could expand a bit on what the Stoics meant by virtue and how its pursuit fit into their philosophical schema um, uh, would be helpful to me. But also, where does virtue fit into modern day Stoics? You list a many, you know, number of people in the book, uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and others. I, I just got to say, I don't usually associate the word virtue um, with, with that cast of characters. Uh, and I see what, what, what they say about Stoicism uh, more as a form of self-control, self-mastery, uh, so that they can go off and do whatever good or nefarious harm you know, they want to do. But virtue just doesn't jump off the page at me when I think of this cast of characters. So virtue then and now in Stoic thought. 
Okay, real, real fast, just uh, virtue then. Um, the term in Greek is excellence, uh, gets Romanized, Latinized to uh, virtus. And it's for the Stoics, uh, as it was for Aristotle, a little bit uh, less so for Plato, uh, it is this, uh, a character state through and through informed by the good use of reason, by reason. And what's weird, back to the language problem, is for the Stoics, it, it's, it, it's, it doubles with the word wisdom, really. It's, they're always this sort of the same in Greek philosophy, your um, practical wisdom and virtue. And it's trafficking in the world. It's selecting the best, you know, health today, maybe disease today, because that's how, uh, how the world is turning out. It sounds weird. Maybe it's suicide if you're Seneca and Nero says it's the end is coming, you know, and so, so Seneca opts for his suicide. So virtue is actually wisdom in making wise selections in the world that we might not go for this, that are in sync with some larger plan of nature and it has cosmopolitan outreach. Uh, modern Stoics, you're right, they're quite self-absorbed in their entrepreneurial efforts. By modern, I don't mean what Massimo was speaking about, the organization, modern Stoicism, but I mean those who have Silicon Valley and others with lots and lots of money, those folks who, that have come to it. I think the virtue side of Stoicism has been underplayed. All those things we think about, temperance, courage, um, uh, um, uh, justice, um, social change, you know, uh, things that engage us in the world and engage us well with regard to others, they get underplayed. There are books on favors, on benefactions, on mercy, uh, et cetera, that we don't spend much time reading, but rather go into the more self-help uh, kinds of um, uh, literature. Anyway, that's, that's, it's a wordy answer, but um, there you go. No, I, just... I, I agree. I, I think there is there's a, a, yet another way of looking at uh, virtue from the perspective of the ancient stones, and that's Epictetus. Epictetus actually doesn't talk about virtue much. I don't think, I don't think the words actually appears at all in the discourses, or very, very, very little. But it does, it does talk about judgment, good judgment, good moral judgment, right? And so it seems, as Nancy said, this, for the Stoics, at some point, it seems like virtue, wisdom, and good judgment are essentially synonymous. Uh, and what that means is you should simply try to be the best human being that you can, particularly in the ethical realm. Excellent. The, the original word excellence, the original arete, actually applies to everything. Uh, there can be such a thing as an excellent knife, meaning a knife that performs its function in, in a, in a top-notch fashion. So from that perspective, a billionaire, you know, somebody, an entrepreneur who does make it very well and makes billions is an excellent uh, meaning in that sense here. But the Stoics were interested in particular in the ethical aspect of it. So we should try to be excellent from an ethical perspective, which means interacting with other people. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists, Nancy, Barbara, Massimo, as well as those of you in the audience. There were a number of folks uh, who had questions that we didn't get to. My apologies to you. Please join us in just a handful of days on Monday, September 27th at 4 p.m. when the Washington History Seminar returns to discuss Eric Zoloff's new book, The Last Good Neighbor, Mexico in the Global 60s. We hope you can join us. Till then, take care, thank you, and good night.